if you want to be a composer, stop listening to film scores and wanting to sound like other film scores. You, you, ha you spend a lot of time just developing your own sound by creating. No one at the beginning of their career knows what they sound like. And if they tell you they know what they sound like, they're wrong. You hear a lot of talk about um, a composer's sound and how to develop your own sound and how a young composer or how people who are, are just starting to write, um, how they can develop their own sound. And I know I heard John Powell talk about this same subject and I think what he said was, stop listening to film score. <laughs> you know, if you, if, if you want to be a composer, stop listening to film scores and wanting to sound like other film scores. Now, I think that there's some truth to that, but not totally. I enjoy listening to, to film scores. I enjoy listening to the you know masters like Jerry Goldsmith and and, and John Williams and 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 um, you know Tom Newman, all these really really beautiful uh, film composers. But there is something to be said about not getting too wrapped up in trying to be like someone. Um, but really, your own sound isn't something that you can just make. You know, you can't just make. Your, develop your own sound by magic. It's something that happens over a long period of time in, in the way you tend to write chord changes or the way you tend to harmonize certain chords or the way you tend to use intervals and melodies and stuff. And I think once you have a sound of your own, then you start thinking about how to make that sound and, and what instruments make that sound or what um, how you can mess up an instrument um, to make a different sound, or how you can turn something on its head and make it sound different, all while trying to infuse your particular um, musical stamp. Because the point of being a composer is, you have this way of writing music, and you write, I tend to write in one way, some, some other composers tend to write in another way, and then you sort of apply that to a sonic palette. So, the way I sort of look at it in terms of developing my own sound, I spent my entire life writing, you know, the first 20 years of my career I spent writing songs for my band. And, you know, the songs, I, I go back and listen to songs I wrote 25 years ago and I'm like, oh my God, that's terrible, it's awful, I would, ne I mean, I can't even listen to that. You know, but you, you write those and then you write the next thing and it gets better and better and better in your own mind, not necessarily for other people, but, you, you, ha you spend a lot of time just developing your own sound by creating. Um, and then how you apply that to any sort of given sonic palette is, I think, how you would apply that from, from one project to another. They asked me to do Star Trek, and Star Trek has a very definitive sonic palette. Like, it has a very specific sound to it. There's big brass passages, there's, you know, there's strings, there's, you know, uh, glockenspiel, and there's percussion, and when I first went to think about what I, what I was going to do for Star Trek, you know, I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to change what Star Trek was. I didn't want to change the the sound of the show, but I can only write the way I write. You know, I can, I can only write from my perspective and how I write different chord harmonies and what I tend to do. So how was I going to apply that to, um, to this particular sonic palette? And then I thought about how I could tweak it to be my own. You know, like what, what could I do to, to make it, um, you know, have that Star Trek signature and then also have a little bit of my, my feeling in it. Um, and I think you, that only comes after a long time of doing it over and over and over again that you, that you, um, that you start to find what your sound is. Like, I, I listen back to certain scores and I, ser I, I definitely hear a pattern in how I like to um, do things and how I like to put things together. So I'm, I'm always trying to, to, to sort of press that envelope outward um, so I'm not, I don't repeat myself, but in the end, I think people do repeat themselves because you, you tend to find a groove and you tend to find a thing that you do really well um, and you, you, you fall back on those positions and, you, and I, there's, I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. Like the greatest composers out there, they, their ability to write a new beautiful melody 
and at the same time, it still sounds like them. You know, that's Mozart. You know, you, you listen to Mozart, and there's so many different melodies, but you always know that you're like, oh, that sounds like Mozart, because it sounds like Mozart, you know? And not necessarily because you've heard so much of it, because, like, once you hear one thing or a few things, you start to sort of get the idea, oh, that sounds like, yeah, it's different than that, but it sounds kind of like that same person. Mahler's the same, you know? Um, he, he, he wrote these really beautiful m musical passages and really aggressive musical passages, and they're different from, you know, Mahler 1, Mahler 2, and all these different um, pieces of music, but they all sound kind of like him. And I think that that happens, and I think that that's okay. Um, you don't have to be a different composer every project. You want, the, you want to apply yourself to the project. I think that's why people are hiring you. That's why people are, you know, wanting your music <laughs> in a particular project. Um, so I, I kind of feel like it, it's a dance that you that you that you dance with yourself, trying to figure out what you sound like. And I think that no one at the beginning of their career knows what they sound like. And if they tell you they know what they sound like, they're wrong, because you don't find that f until you're doing it for long enough, until you really sort of become comfortable with yourself. I mean, you know, are there exceptions to that rule? Sure, there are exceptions to every rule. There are six-year-old prodigies who can play, you know. Beethoven's piano sonata, you know, and it's like, well, okay, that's, that's not, that, they're outliers. But like the, the, the rest, for the rest of us, it takes a while to sort of figure out what you, what you sound like. Well, you know, I, I think that being, being a film composer, being a television composer, being a game composer, being, being a composer for any sort of media that you are lending your talents to someone else's artistic, overall artistic vision, which is what a composer, which is what a composer of film, TV, and video games, and media does. You know, we're not sitting in a studio writing music for us. We'd like to think that we are, <laughs> but, but we're not. And I think that one of the things that is very important is to have a broad sense of music in general to, to help, um, to help understand how different music affects different people, because that's the most important thing. With when when you're writing music for um, for for any medium for someone else, um, you have to try to understand how music is going to affect that person and how how they're going to react to any kind of music. So having a broad range of not necessarily musical ability, but a broad range of musical knowledge and a broad range of a musical palette. Is, is really important. And I think that I, I came from being in a rock band with having no experience writing orchestral music, no experience with any instruments other than the instruments that I played. I played guitar, I played bass, I played drums, I played piano, you know, stuff that I would play in my band. And we would like write songs and I'd bang chords out on the piano and we'd sing. Or I'd bang chords out on my guitar or I'd sit behind the drum kit while the singer in the band was singing something. And that's how we sort of wrote songs. And I think that lent itself to how I write music now. I tend to think only about what the top line is going to do. Like, what, what's the melody? Even if it's just chords. Like, where's the melody in the chord changes? And I, that, to me, comes from my background as a songwriter. Because all that mattered was, the chords didn't even really matter. All that mattered was, what, what's the singer doing? And what melody is the singer? And is that memorable? Can you, is that hummable? Do you sing that? And I, I think that I try to apply that to what I do. Um, so having that as a background, I think, certainly has helped me find my own sound in this, in this world of, of writing music for, for films and TV and stuff. I think it varies from project to project. I think there's some projects that require a lot of that and some projects where it's not necessary. I think, you know, there are genres that that certainly lend itself more to, to that. And I, I, but I think creating a sound, creating a, a vibe of what you're going to put your music in is very important to know about. And, you know, on certain projects, I've spent a lot of time building sound beds to then house the melodies. You know, um, there, there are some people, I think, out there who don't want melody. They, they don't want a memorable score. They want... They want just to feel, 
You know, they just want the feeling of music, but they don't want to hear music. And that those are very sound design type scores. Um, and there's a they're, they're, they can be very effective. And I think that it's important to be able to do that. And it's important to be able to sort of make a signature in that sound. So, you know, one of the things I like to try to do for any project is to create that sort of sound verse. You know, the the whatever whatever the um, the whole context of the of the score is going to be in, even if there's an orchestral element, even if there's a major orchestral element, um, even with with Star Trek or for Fargo, um, for instance, there was a very big orchestral element, but there was also a very big sound design element to that score, and we we needed to sort of be able to you know transition between those two worlds and and have it be almost undetectable so we spent a lot of time making sound beds and sound design elements in order to fit um what was going to fit with an orchestral element you know and how could it go from sound design to a simple solo instrument that then took you into just an orchestra and how could it then go back and forth and a lot of that is you know spending a lot of time figuring out what sounds right with an orchestra playing in the key of D or what sounds right with an orchestra playing in the key of you know a flat you know and if you're going back if not all that sound design that works in D is going to work in a flat so you have to sort of figure all that out it's very complex but I think it's really important to to sort of give every th every um, project its own sort of signature sound design as well.